In the biology section of orthodontic movement, we learn the importance of controlling parameters such as intensity and direction of applied force in order to obtain appropriate cellular response for a safe and efficient tooth movement. Now, in the section of mechanics, we will deepen into the elementary concepts of physics applied to orthodontics. Knowing the biomechanical foundations of clinical orthodontics means that we don't longer need to be captive of any specific technique or appliance. Understanding biomechanics significantly amplifies our therapeutic resource for the application of orthodontic force. Force is the protagonist of orthodontic movement. And that's why we will begin our studies in mechanics, focusing on it. For this, we will use whiteboard drawings, since this topic requires much visualization for its appropriate understanding. Let's start by defining force as being the action of one body over another. As we are talking about orthodontic force, the bodies that apply the actions constitute our appliance which can be springs, elastics, wires, or any agent capable of applying a mechanical stimulus to the teeth. These, in turn, represent the bodies that receive the actions of the appliance. Mechanical force usually causes deformation and or movement of the bodies on which they act. As teeth are considered rigid bodies, movement is the only possible result for them. And it is precisely this result that we want to understand and even predict. This is what orthodontists must do in their daily clinical life. In order to understand the orthodontic force, we need to know that it constitutes a vector quantity, so its definition requires the awareness of three essential attributes. They are the point of application of force, its magnitude, and its direction and sense. The point of application represents the point of contact of our appliance with the tooth to be moved. Whenever possible, it's the professional who determines this point. For example, you can choose to apply a force directly to a bracket, which we'll call point one. Or you can apply your force on a small piece of wire attached to the bracket. In this case, we will have a point two. Or you can choose to connect your spring into a great extension of wire attached to the bracket. And here we will have point three. Intuitively, we already know that these three situations will cause different movements. However, before we predict the resulting movements, we need to analyze the other attributes of the force. Let's suppose that you have chosen point one, that is, your point of application will be the bracket, and the spring is connected to a mini implant, located at a certain distance from the point of application. The magnitude of the force will depend on the characteristics of the spring. And suppose that in this case, the applied value is 50 grams, which will obviously be perceived by both the mini implant and the tooth. As the mini implant will be fixed, we will focus on our object of interest, which is the tooth. Notice that the connection of the ends of the spring defines one of the most important parameters of all, the line of action of the force, which in this case can be easily visualized by the spring itself. We can analyze the inclination of this line in relation to some reference plane. If our reference is the occlusal plane, for example, we will see that the line of action of the force lies at 40 degrees of it. And this angle can be called the angle of incidence of the force. As I said, the line of action of the force represents its most important attribute. Let's see why. Going further in our example, where we have already defined the desired line of action of force, you can apply your force at absolutely any point along that line. And the resulting movement will always be the same. That is, if instead of inserting your spring directly into the bracket, you decide to create an appliance configuration to apply the force at a point ahead the previous one, but in the same line of action. In both situations, your movement will essentially be the same. This principle is called the law of transmissibility. In short, it states that distinct points of application along the same line of action of force provoke exactly the same effects. To conclude this explanation, we will try to predict the resulting movements in our initial example, from which we selected three distinct application points, which also established three different lines of force action in this case. Do you think the resulting movements will be similar? Obviously not. 
Since we have three different lines of force in each situation, we can certainly predict three distinct dental movements according to the chosen line of action. If we apply force at point one, we will have a tipping movement, in which the crown will move more than the roof, and the tooth will undergo a slight intrusion. If you choose point two, the tooth will move with minimal change of its long axis, and without significant change in the vertical direction. And finally, the application of force at point 3 will cause slight extrusion and greater roof movement. We are not yet making an exact prediction of the movements, but the supremacy of the line of action of the force as determinant of the direction of the movement obtained is already clear in these images. To recap, in today's animation, we reviewed the basic attributes of the orthodontic force, namely, they are magnitude, point of application, direction and sense of the force. Whenever we plan and perform a tooth movement, especially in more complex cases, we need to be aware of these basic parameters. But this class was just the beginning. We will never have accuracy in our movement predictions if we don't have a good comprehension of the concepts of center of resistance and moments. These are the topics awaiting for us in our next class.